Hello and welcome to Navara FM on Resonance 104.4 FM, London's very finest radio station. I am James Butler. This week I have been joined by Will Davies to discuss his new book, Nervous States, How Feeling Took Over the World. The book is expansive and its central concern is a dethroning of reason and of expertise, both of which were central to the construction of the modern state by the passions or by the irrational. And there are a plethora of books trying to define this shift. Most of them seek to defend the beleaguered crew of experts from a rather caricatured, irrational mob, or at least bewail the state of democracy that it should have come to this. That knee-jerk defence isn't present in this book, so I began by asking Will what prompted its writing. Well, what sparked it was, I suppose, in the first place, the Brexit referendum of 2016. And I wrote a series of blog posts over that summer um, and other pieces trying to make sense of what had happened. Um, And I think that what most interested me about that particular political event, and I think there are other um, populist uprisings and and surges that, that this is also true of, is was that it seemed to dispense with economic reason. I mean, a lot of my work in, in previous books, The Limited Neoliberalism and The Happiness Industry, has been trying to understand where a particular ideal of economic rationality comes from um, over the last 100 or 200 years. And what interested me most about what happened with Brexit, and is still there, and, and of course is also what drives a lot of hardcore Remainers mad, is the sense that this is a, a moment of economic ra- irrationality, that this is a, a dispensation with, with with self-interest on the part of individuals and the collective. So that was, I suppose, where it started. And, and I wanted to, rather than just to bemoan that, because in some ways I, I found it, in some ways, if, I'm, if I'm honest, quite exciting in, in its own way, although also rather frightening. And I think those are, I suppose, both of those, those emotions are in the book um, was to try and understand it really and to to use a sociological imagination and historical uh, perspective and the history of ideas in order to understand that and to understand it necessarily means not simply bemoaning it but also means trying to understand that there is a logic to what is arising at the moment it's not just a a demolition job it's not just a, a collapse of truth and facts and so on as so many of the post-truth books have suggested it's there is something else coming along and we might not like that other thing and certainly a lot of Rema- remainers and and liberals uh, don't like that other thing but but nevertheless it has a shape to it and we can understand where it comes from um and if we're to try and cling on to what came before and there's aspects of the book which you know there are aspects of that which I take very seriously. I don't want to simply kind of celebrate the, the, the collapse of, of of what came before, but I think we need to understand kind of what it would mean to to, to, to reconstruct bits of it. So, what are the contours of that kind of dethroning uh, mm. or, or that that rejection? Mm. Well, there are uh, the the book starts by suggesting that there are there are a couple of key philosophical binaries that have been dissolving for some time, but are now visibly uh, uh, no longer credible. Um, And the first is the core Hobbesian distinction between uh, peace and war, um, which was uh, established by not only in the work of Thomas Hobbes, but also by the key uh, legal liberal uh, institutions of the mid-17th century. And the second is the distinction between mind and body of that was most famously proposed by Rene Descartes at the similar point in history. And these are, as I, as I, as I suggest in the book, these are really the, the, the kind of cornerstones of, of, of modern thinking about the self, about politics, about society. So this is to, to suggest that these are in, that these have dissolved is obviously quite a grand claim, but I'm not suggesting it happened kind of overnight on the 23rd of June 2016. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I say that, you know, that the, 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 the pressures on these have been underway for some time, the, the rise of um, the psychological and psychiatric and psychoanalytic sciences since the late 19th century have gradually kind of weakened uh, the the idea of the mind as a, as a separate rational entity. Meanwhile, technological changes in the nature of war, starting with the rise of aerial bombing, but now right through to things like drone warfare and so on, have meant that the realm of civilian power, or civil power, that traditionally was kept separate from war, the police forces, um, prisons, uh, probation services and so on, used to be completely separate from, from military power. This distinction no longer makes sense either. So we're in this kind of, I suppose, 
postmodern might immediately <laughs> rustle up ideas of <laughs> Jean-François Lyotard or Derrida or something, but it, but it's it, it, it's postmodern in a particular sense. In a sense, chronological sense. In a chronological sense that, that the key props of modernity uh, are no longer working, um, and maybe they haven't been working for a long time, but they were nevertheless credible for some time. Um, and the, part of the book is trying to understand why that has, has come about, and that's partly a technological set of trends that have happened, but it's also, I think, trends within the economy that have been, uh, have been pushing against against those like what well i mean for one thing um part of the uh, achievement and i think it's an achievement that we should we should value um while also recognizing it's the, the harm that it's done at certain points in history but part of the achievement of the 17th century was to achieve a scientific perspective on society um and i talk about some of the early earliest technocrats the earliest statisticians people like william petty and john grant and so on who um were pioneers of the uh, application of techniques of measurement and mathematics and of calculation that had first been put to work in the study of uh, things like the movement of planets and that sort of thing in the solar system, um, but put it to work in the study of population. Um, and this has a, a, a dubious history in some ways. It has a bloody history. It also is a history that of, of, of empire. But nevertheless, it's also how we gain any sense of, of what society is as an empirical object if we're to understand things like poverty empirically or inequality empirically or uh, other forms of exclusion in a scientific sense rather than just in a in a sort of suspicious or or or, um, uh, or theoretical sense uh, we need these techniques now one of the things i argue in the book is that um, the experts that or the, the, the some of the key indicators that have the uh, modern nation states have depended on in recent decades such as gdp um, unemployment um inflation. These have been losing credibility partly as a result of rising inequality. Um, in the United States, for example, um, 50% of people have had no increase in their real income since the late 1970s. So that's 40 years in which half of the population have not been experiencing economic growth. Meanwhile, the political discourse is constantly focused on economic growth as the main indicator of progress. So just to use that as just one example, why would progress continue to make sense as a political project if it's not if it's including only half of the population? There are other sorts of cases, and I think unemployment is another one that I talk about in the bit in the book. But the aspiration to apply an objective perspective to political issues depends on the that perspective having some kind of broader public credibility it's not experts don't have some god-given right in order to to be listened to or to be deemed credible the pronouncements of experts and of statisticians and social scientists and economists depends on their capacity to tell plausible stories about the world i mean in that sense it's a it's a pragmatist thesis that that, that runs through much of the book and i think those stories have lost credibility in quite fundamental and profound ways meaning that alternative ways of understanding the collective necessarily kind of uh, start to fill in the space it's it's an interesting thing that emerges i think in the book that there is you know obviously a sense that a mere defense of the existing order is insufficient mm. And that also, also, and, and as you're suggesting, that maybe maybe some of the features of the contemporary aren't novel per se. So the antipathy mm. between reason and emotion is an old one. You know, fears of the crowd, mm. as as you know, you mm. know, certainly stretch back to at least the 19th century. Mm. Probably, frankly, a lot longer. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so, and I guess in, in one sense, I have you know, I I always wonder about that when crowds come up in in a book because mm. that that question about. <laughs> You know, when you have someone like Jefferson even talking about the democracy, mm. you know, hating the idea, you know, the, the, the being mm. fearful about, you know, the unrestrained passions uh, of, of a mass or of a mob. Um, you know, uh, so one thing that perhaps is new, and it's something that occurs, again, at various points throughout the book, uh, is speed. Yeah. And at some points you, you, you seem to praise a, a certain kind of slowness, a sort mm. of resistant slowness, a rational slowness. Mm. So does the, the speed of contemporary communications technology mm. have a, you know, a qualitative yeah. uh, effect on, on, on politics, on political discourse? Uh, yes, and, and you, you, you're absolutely right to, to, to identify that. This is, a, this is a key theme in the book. I mean, it, I suppose, to, to put it in quite simple terms, um, there are, the, the book is organised around two um, ideals of what knowledge is and why we value knowledge. One which emerges, I argue, in the mid-17th century and the other which emerges around about the time of the, the French Revolution. And the first 
is an ideal of knowledge as as consensus, as the capacity to tell a to give a, a a picture of the world that we can all then agree on. And this is basically what liberals value when they value expertise and and reason and objectivity. It's the idea that there is a perspective on the world that is neutral and which therefore everybody can can sign up to. And that really is what animates BBC journalists or uh, climate scientists or um, uh, orthodox economists. And 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 there's some there's something of that that we need to cling on to quite tightly despite the fact that I've just called it liberal and I'm on Navarra <laughs> there's, still, there's still something there that we that we must value um, and I think that even someone like Karl Marx would have would have recognized that in the sense that political economy comes out of that out of that tradition and political economy allows you to be able to understand how capitalism is changing in in in, in a way that is that that has some uh, uh, sort of philosophical epistemological um, uh, credibility um, so that's one ideal of knowledge the second ideal of knowledge is that I, 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 what is valuable about knowledge is knowing stuff before you know it. Um, and so if, I, if I'm a hedge fund manager, or for that matter, if I'm in some kind of theatre of war of some kind, or if I'm a troll, or if I'm um, some kind of, um, you know, sort of uh, underhand kind of uh, political spin doctor or something, it's all about being able to get things first. And it's all about being able to uh, control the situation through knowing more than my rivals in one way or another. That involves secrecy, that involves encryption, that involves intercepting what other people are saying. Now, these this idea of knowledge is in some ways what... Uh, how social media <laughs> works in lots of ways. That it's how meme culture works because meme culture is really about trying to tell jokes that most people aren't going to be able to get except your allies and hopefully to undermine your enemies in some ways. So that ideal of knowledge is the is, is one that I argue originates in war and it's one which I r- trace through the ideas of the Prussian general and uh, theorist of war Karl von Clausewitz, who was this, who was kind of bowled over by how Napoleon had turned war into a into a modern, uh, highly um, uh, technical, rather kind of nihilistic phenomenon of of trying to kind of completely demolish other nation states, um, but. Everything that Clausewitz was interested in about Napoleon wasn't his ability to sort of achieve broad public consensus, far from it. It was the ability to know stuff before other people knew it, to manipulate the truth so that other people were kept in the dark. To Napoleon was an extremely able propagandist in terms of printing newspapers that were sent back to Paris for people to read and were full of things which were not strictly true and so on. So there is a, this second ideal of knowledge, which is the, the ideal of not of war, the, the ideal of knowledge that, that, that I would argue emerges in war and the technologies that are developed in war, which include things like radar and satellite and uh, the internet and the computer, are all about trying to speed up my capacity to know things before you have the capacity to know them or the, or the capacity to react to them. Now, in a way, the infiltration of that mentality of and, and, that, and that idea of knowledge into civil society, which is really what social media has, 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 has enacted in, in lots of ways and ways that are exciting as well as rather kind of the unsettling um, has meant that politics has come to take on some of the qualities of war and has meant that, that that civil discourse has started to in some ways feel more like violent discourse and that's kind of one of the key claims in the book it's I mean, it's interesting you, you draw on a distinction made by Hannah Arendt between power and violence which I think is maybe a useful way to mm. think about this yeah about that. Um, I mean this is in Arendt's on violence and in that she argues that the idea of power is the capacity to, in a sense, coordinate people, to create institutions, to uh, achieve certain kinds of outcomes. So if you build a bureaucracy or you create a constitution or a parliament or a firm, for that matter, you are constructing something new in the world that has some kind of durability and can and, and can, can change the world, can, do, can, can get things done, can achieve positive outcomes. It can also achieve negative outcomes. I mean, the, um, as, you know, Sigmund Bauman writing about the Holocaust, for instance, it was writing all about how all of the same instruments of modernity that achieve the positive effects can be put towards the most horrifying ones. So there's nothing innately good about power. It's just that power has this constructive quality in the world. Violence has a purely destructive quality. It's purely instrumental. And violence is, in a sense, the... The, the the capacity to simply to I mean I use examples that I mean one of the ways I use this in the book is to say where does this notion of weaponization come from and in a way if you terrorism 
operates purely through through violence. It doesn't it doesn't produce in something in the world. It doesn't it doesn't render the world more governable or controllable. It simply undermines the capacity of others to do so. Equally, you could say that in in, a, in the discursive and symbolic space, that's in a way what 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 trolling mm-hmm. does on online is it undermines the capacity of others to maintain uh, to, to 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 achieve kind of forms of coordination and cooperation and so on. So it has this purely instrumental capacity. It doesn't, there's a line that Arendt uses, which I rather like, which is um, that uh, violence can undermine power, but but power can never come out of violence. The uh, the main effect of violence, she argues, is a more violent world. So that, yes, you can, intu- I mean, I, I could I could hurl something at you right now and it would have changed the situation, <laughs> but it wouldn't have actually, it wouldn't it have achieved really something. Interesting show. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it wouldn't have achieved, we wouldn't have sort of, we wouldn't have constructed anything yeah. it just simply would have undermined the capacity for the rest of this conversation to to go in any kind of um a sort of productive way <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, I i sort of and in all these questions i think about your your two kind of early modern uh kind of forefathers uh, of this day and obviously in, in one sense you know descartes is important because mm. he gives us you know the thinking thing the thing distinct from the body mm. i.e that that is defined primarily as ratiocinative mm. that uh, you know, receive sensation, but is in some in some important sense distinct from mm. them, right? Mm. Um, and you know, I think you you use a, a metaphor in the book of of it being you know a, as an astronomer in an observatory, yes. yeah. um, which I thought was quite a nice way of putting it. So so that you know that figure certainly, and there's you know there's a very clear history of that mm. n- no longer being quite sufficient mm. to our understanding of how the body works, how the mind works. Uh, and also of of simply the the phenomena mm. that have you know the social phenomena that have arisen since uh, Descartes' time and that mm. includes you know the the rise of democracy. Yeah. The other thing, though, from your other forefather that I I think is interesting is is Hobbes and Hobbes, um, you know, Hobbes gives us you know, the first modern account of the state. Mm. And, you know, I think you could cogently argue that all of political philosophy is a footnote to Hobbes mm. uh, in, in that sense, in that he's you know the defining account of the state for for all subsequent theorists, you know, whether they agree or disagree with him. And and for him it's an account that's intimately bound up with fear. Yeah. Um, you know, Hobbes in in uh he writes a poem near the end of his life where he calls himself, you know, he says, I was born a twin of fear. Right. Yeah. It's a rather sort of wonderful line. Um and, and I wonder if there's there's something about that specific emotion mm. Um, that's really integral to your account because it seems yeah. to me that fear and, and popular fear mm. uh, is something that recurs both in accounts of, of Trump, of Brexit, of these kind of phenomena, but that has like a maybe a sort of more undergirding mm. role in contemporary politics. Yeah. Well, I mean, to take the the, the Descartes and Hobbes together for a minute and to say, to look at this, these two binaries that I mentioned earlier of, of war, peace, mind, body, and, and and what does it mean for both of those to become murky at the very least, if not to say that they've completely kind of um, been demolished? Well, what it means is that the status of violence is no longer clear. And we see this all around us every day. We see it in arguments about free speech and when is speech violence. Um, we see it in... Um, discussions which uh, hover around syndromes and, and diagnoses such as post-traumatic stress disorder, which I discuss a bit in the book because it, I think it, although it's not something that fortunately most people actually experience in their lives, nevertheless, it indicates, I think, a, a, a cultural um, uh, problem that is a, that, that, that has become politically very um, uh, fraught in our society, which is the question of at what point does a cultural experience or a set of uh, or do, do words start to um, be, uh, achieve the status of violence? Um, and I think that it's something that um, is, 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 is raises so many kind of important philosophical questions as much as anything else. Um, but I think that this question of fear is in some ways tied up with the, this, the uncertainty of, of where violence might lie or what violence might consist of. Um, and I think so for the, the reasoning that Hobbes goes through for just to kind of recap on, on Hobbes is that Hobbes argues that human beings might all be angelic. <laughs> they might all be utterly virtuous and peace loving and, 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 and altruistic and so on. But there is this 
I suppose, tragedy of, of human beings, which is that they don't know what's going on in each other's heads. They can see each other's um, behaviour. They can listen to each other's words, but people can lie. They can um, uh, be given various pieces of proof and so on, but the proof could be fabricated. There is this fundamental problem that suspicion is a is actually quite a natural condition for human beings. And, and suspicion then breeds fear because... If I don't know, you, you know, you might tell me that you, you, all you want is to is to be my friend, but I don't have any real way of knowing that for sure. Now, if Hobbes had, you know, was writing in in towards the end of a of thirty years of of, of of very bloody religious warfare across Europe, and um, he also had actually fled the English civil war for France uh, in fear of his own life because he was being read as a monarchist, and 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 that I think casts some perspective on this as well. But I think that um, for Hobbes. All of the other fruits of modernity, whether that be commerce, science, um, great art, uh, great political debate and so on, none of them could happen until this condition of fear could be got rid of, first of all. all he, he was, in some ways, a great sort of maybe not an optimist but he he certainly had great hopes that these things might come about and it's mm. interesting that with the period we're talking about is really over 100 years before what's generally called the enlightenment so the enlightenment came quite a long time after these sorts of debates were going on um, but yes it's it's true that in the, the the first role of the state is to overcome this 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 problem of, of mutual suspicion and mutual fear now that suggests that when fear starts to arise, that is in some ways a legitimacy crisis for the liberal state on its own terms. Mm-hmm. And there is plenty of evidence, particularly across um, mainland Europe at the moment, that fear is rising in various ways. And that is to do with the refugee crisis. It's to do with a general loss of credibility of, of, of political elites. It's to do with... Um, uh, the, the austerity. Um, and so I think that the, the, in some ways what Hobbes reminds us is that the liberal state, the modern state, starts with a kind of psychological trick, which is to say that, uh, or, or in game theory terms, to a kind of overcoming of the prisoner's dilemma, which is to say, right, I'm going to in some ways achieve a sort of willing suspension of disbelief where we're all going to have to believe that we're all good people and we're going to do so because we're going to centralise all powers of violence in the hands of the state and they're going to punish people who are bad people. And and, and this is a sort of a, 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 a clever um, sort of leap of faith that occurs from where on you have this thing called civil society, which Hobbes believes is the, is the most important achievement of all. But I think it's true that this kind of the 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 the, the blurring of the definition of violence which is also going hand in hand with the rise of fear as a as a uh, emotional and cultural phenomenon is is at the heart of some of the crises that are facing the liberal state right now so they're both symptomatic in in that sense so, i mean it's it's interesting i was thinking as you as you were as you were talking that there there is here you know something that seems like a a connection to me both between you know your two early modern giants um and it has to do with authority right mm. and so and and in one sense that's the thing that's also being questioned with our you know experts etc mm. nowadays is that you know authority derives from you know whether you know, you're credentialed or mm. you know so you have a, a kind of degree of social trust you know it arises in the case of uh you know <laughs> it arises partly because uh, you are the sovereign yeah <laughs> uh, in some cases but 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 that 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 sense of there being you know, generalized crisis of authority mm. is something that actually stretches back a bit further than the contemporary, right? It's something that you can see emerging in the 60s, certainly mm. that there is this kind of generalized distrust mm. of any kind of claim to authority, right? Yeah. So it, 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 you know, it manifests in various ways. You, mm. you have obviously you have social movements that contest, mm. um, you know, that, that are all about bringing things that are excluded from the definition of, you know, political concerns into the yes. political. So yeah. that might be feminism, it might be gay rights, it might be, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, um, you know, uh, while at the same time uh, saying that the, the kind of regimes that are founded on, you know, this particular definition of politics mm. are, are no longer mm. sufficient. Now, that anti-authoritarianism plays out in the academic humanities and some ways, you know, this wild distrust of grand narratives, etc. You should say mm. that I'm not adhering to uh, an argument that that, that uh, everything is Derrida's fault, um, <laughs> which I think is now very fashionable in America. Um, but but there, there does seem to me to be something there that's mm. that's a that's a problem, right? And and it's something that's mirrored, or that you know, for, for me, very often that you know, the the test cases, or or you know, the the, the political situations that. I go to simply because I know a lot about it are the kind of post-war politics in Italy, which is, of course, very Mm. interesting because you have a very weak uh, and not necessarily very credible democratic state. Mm. You have a very fragile constitution and you have the rise of kind of armed and violent political Mm. groups, which seem to me not only to be, you know, 
a consequence of the crisis of that kind of state, but also because they these are people who have returned from war. These are people who were involved in partisan and anti-fascist mm-hmm. struggles, and so who had, um, you know, a, not only a kind of psychological proximity to violence, mm-hmm. Um, but also the means to use it yeah. uh, and, and were also less likely to be convinced about uh, the way in which the state was operating. Mm. Now, that's that particular situation. There's a, you know, there's a history to that. So we find ourselves today in, in perhaps a similar crisis, mm. but without such clear proximity. That's a good, very to, good point. To, yeah. to war. I never thought about it quite like that. I mean, it's also true that if you read um, histories of the 1930s, I mean, you read some of like Eric Hobsbawm's Age of Extremes, for instance. He points out how important it was that the Nazi leaders had been in the trenches because once you've seen people being mown down by machine guns without anyone appearing to to, to care politically, your understanding of of the value of li- of a life politically is, is is transformed and it doesn't get changed back suddenly. And I think that's I think it's a very good point, which is that it has been this sort of extraordinary period uh, that most people have have been a long way from from war. In, in the in the traditional sense. Meanwhile, of course, the kind of metaphor of war seems to spread everywhere, and that's one of the things that kind of interests me in the book, partly. I mean, I think that what, you're, what you're saying, another way of, of, of exploring this is that, to go back to Hobbes for a second, Hobbes, in a way, and he was a he was a dualist in Descartes' sense as well. He also believed, broadly speaking, in the in a kind of philosophical distinction between the rationality of the free mind versus the the completely causal physicality of the body. But in a way, what Hobbes, I suppose, was doing by by with his uh, ambition to exclude um, all violence from politics was to exclude the body from politics. Was to was to have a politics that was purely governed by by the mind. And in that sense, he was it was a kind of prototype of enlightenment, but a kind of the sort of pessimistic beginnings of what would later become seen as enlightenment and the body has been coming in back in in all sorts of ways that you you alluded to in 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 the work of the various social movements and um uh, the various um, critiques of liberalism that have that have drawn attention to the fact that different bodies get different statuses in the political realm, that this ideal of rationality that Descartes sort of called human actually was never human. It was white male Western uh, uh, privilege mm. and that actually it wasn't something that – and of course also the same is true equally of – of Hobbes' idea of civil society was not something that that, that colonized uh, spaces. They didn't have the the virtue of being governed in a in a legal liberal fashion. There there was no distinction between military and and civil violence in 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 those spaces. So of course, and and that is the the the, the post colonial and the feminist uh, argument that has been made over over the um over, over the past seventy years or so. But there's one other figure that I want to want to throw in here, um and. It, which is the the neoliberals, um, and there's a whole chapter mm. about. Uh, I don't use the term neoliberal. I don't know if you noticed, but yeah, I, just was, couldn't, uh, I couldn't be bothered to sort of go there really. But um, but it, I mean, it's about Friedrich Hayek and in particular and and Ludwig von Mises. But um, Hayek was, I, I sometimes provocatively say, the most influential postmodernist of the 20th century <laughs> because Hayek was very very suspicious of these experts with their objective facts and their claims to some kind of authority over the rest of society, and asked these quite cynical questions about. Well, what 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 were they trying to achieve with these with these claims of knowledge? What interests were they serving? And this turns into things like public choice theory, which assumes that all bureaucrats and experts are ultimately just out for money and like more job security and that sort of thing. Um, and the thing about Hayek was that he also, in some ways, brought the body back in in quite interesting ways because Hayek. Although he was ultimately believed that the market and the price system would be the way in which we could sort out all of our differences, and that was his kind of answer to the Hobbesian sort of challenge, was, well, you don't really need law, or you kind of do need law, but not more important than law almost is a, is a price system through mm. which all these disagreements will sort of be resolved. But he believed that the market was such a sort of brilliant kind of mediator that we could all be as impulsive and emotional and as and as sort of kind of enslaved to our bodies as we liked. And the market would do all of the kind of rationalizing and the calculating on our behalf. Therefore, we don't need things like statisticians and economists and experts to kind of take decisions about things like the allocation of goods or any of that kind of thing, let alone planning mm-hmm. the economy, because the market will allow us all to be as irrational and sort of impulsive and 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 um, uh, sort of impassioned as we like, uh, and 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 it will all get sort of sorted out via the rising and falling of prices. Yeah, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing, which you know, is 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 to come back to the question about kind of how did if you know in a sense neoliberalism 
elevates the, 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 the ideal of knowledge, which I, I argue is a kind of warlike ideal, which is mm. good knowledge is stuff you don't know yet, but I do. If you see how that works out in financial services, which is the kind of um, uh, icon of, of neoliberalism, um, it leads to people taking brain supplements mm. or um, investing in better kind of screen technology or in high frequency trading um, investments, such as my computer server is like two meters closer to the Atlantic than your computer server. Therefore, I'm going to get the price signals faster than you. So it turns knowledge into an entirely physical problem, which is that rather than knowledge being something that kind of enters my immaterial, rational, Cartesian mind, knowledge is all about getting the equipment through which I'm going to be able to grasp the world before you do so that I can live in a, a bigger penthouse well, than you. That question, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that question of, of, of secrecy or, mm. or, 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 you know, ad, advantageous knowledge, private advantageous knowledge, I mean, there's a, there's another early modern figure, is one who's who I'm very you know uh, you know very interested in is Francis Bacon, mm. who who writes in his you know little Utopia of the New Atlantis. He talks about you know he envisions a state which is you know frankly primarily technologically run, mm. has a system of government, but in fact all the innovation and all the intelligence goes mm. on in the kind of technocratic caste mm. who live in a big right. tower called the the House of Salomon and. Uh, and it's, so, the, you know, what arises from from that question is like a very early mm. kind of instance of a kind of desire for technocracy. Right? Yes, like, right. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, but also that, that, you know, the question of where power actually mm. lies in that kind of system, because for someone like Hayek, you know, law certainly has a function, but it's primarily to guarantee that, you know, you're yeah. not going to rip people off yeah. uh, in, in the sense that, you know, once you make a payment, you have to. Yes, that's right. Know, Property rights. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I, we should leave. We should leave the early modern period because yeah. um, <coughs> apparently we're in the twenty first century now. <laughs> um, despite how similar they sometimes seem, um, I, I want to think just a little bit more about violence. Um, and and one of the things that occurred to me while reading is is that the modern state has a capacity for violence that's largely been undreamt of in in sort of previous centuries. You know, even if we define violence quite conservatively, you know, let's let's say yeah. it's, you know just yeah. the ability to kill someone. Um, and so, you know, there, there have historically been occasions where it was plausible to think of political change as arriving merely by the application of force from below. Mm. So this is true of Lenin, but it's also mm. it's also true earlier on. It's true in the eighteen forty eight revolution. It's true in the seventeen eighty nine mm. re- revolution in France. Um, it you know, and it's baked into uh, the Second Amendment, right? Mm. So the idea that you yeah. would have you know a bunch of people with some guns, so that you know you could ensure that that your leaders don't become mm. too despotic. That option doesn't seem to exist in politics in Europe or in the United States anymore, certainly, mm. because all of those states are far too powerful mm. to be subject to that kind of political change. It's that kind of change, the, the, the form of politics that, that, that we have. Yeah, and I suppose that's, that's right, is that that is, that that is lacking, and it's something which doesn't re- I didn't really talk about in the book i mean the book uh, i talk quite a lot about things that are becoming quasi-violent in that arentian sense Mm. of a sort of purely instrumental um uh, sort of form of obstacle or or, or deconstruction or demolition or something but um um but I, i think that i think that's absolutely right but i think that also the other thing which has happened which i think might be part of that as well is the way in which violence has 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 moved into the private sector as well which i mean is clearly um I, I think associated with neoliberalism in some sense in the, in, in as much as um there is the, the the sort of privatization of 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 both civil um powers of violence such as prisons um and policing but also of course war is fought increasingly via um commercial uh, uh, entities and i mean the there is i mean my my book kind of I'm not quite answering your question because I don't. I mean, I hadn't I hadn't really sort of uh, hadn't thought about it quite quite in those terms. I, but I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, the, the some of the sort of power imbalances, or certainly the violent imbalances of violence, are, are such that that the, the 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 capacity for that sort of insurrection doesn't seem to kind of shape the elite imaginary in the same way as it as it once did. Which may actually also have been, a, in some ways, a, one of the reasons why elites have lost legitimacy in the way that they have, because they haven't fundamentally cared what was on the in the minds of the masses in the way that you know even someone like Roosevelt was quite worried about what all of these trade unions might want, sort of thing, and and had to sort of kind of think about that. Um, and uh, and no doubt Thatcher probably did as well to a greater extent. 
extent than is than is the case right now. Um, so I think that I, I think that that's that 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 has certainly been a shift. I think that I mean the um, you know I think the the what's coming along in the future, which I talk a bit about in the book, is the is the sort of rise of these kind of Palantir and Amazon for that matter yeah. type companies, where the, um, the 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 tools of of war, certainly in terms of information war, but also the sort of uh, yeah these tools of data analytics that kind of move kind of seamlessly between the realm of the military civil society the economy um forms of kind of exceptional overseas violence that are kind of now normal in in american foreign policy and so on which and are, and are, and are very largely um invisible to most people i mean that's the the other thing so yeah these are those companies are, are, they they always strike me as you know very very state like mm. is yeah. that they have yeah. you know properties that we would mm. typically associate with a state which yeah, you know, right. including you know uh Jeff Bezos with the 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 wave of a hand being able yeah. to you know dispense some public spending <laughs> on his employees and raise their you know raise their wage as a, a you know a way of um ensuring that 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 there that there isn't kind yeah. of yeah. Uh, uh worker organization obviously yeah. notoriously and anti-union um anti-union guy um yeah i mean the 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 point of that question in, in in one sense is 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 just that sense that certainly throughout probably the last 500 years there's a sense that as a mass public gradually emerges the possibility of violence and the mm. possibility of a kind of a kind of violence that's either brought about by demagogues mm. or orators or people who are cynically out to stir up passions mm. for for their own ends arises you know a, a, and has potential consequences that are that are kind of earth shattering and mm. obviously you know the, the classic study in this is Edmund Burke and it, you know when he's writing about the French Revolution is that he's terrified that mm. there is this that, that there is now the capacity for a, you know for an idea to stir people mm. up because Burke thinks it's not just passions; it's it's an idea, right? Uh, and and the thing that's that's really interesting is that that his writing sort of seems to oscillate between, on the one hand, you know, this this kind of Jacobin dogma mm. uh, is what's animating people, and then at the same time, the crowd is also like deeply irrational. And so for him, you know, the power of the of the crowd is is mm. is bound up with its capacity to, for violence. Now, mm. absent that, uh, and I think in some ways it's quite good that that actually you know marauding bands of of a fraction of uh of civil society can't <laughs> impose <laughs> their will uh, entirely violently um you know regardless of what critiques you have of the state mm. i think it's probably good that fascists mm. will find it harder to seize mm. now than they did historically yeah um you know I, you know so, so so absent that it seems to me that 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 you do have the kind of things that would stir up mm. uh that kind of movement that would find that kind of expression uh, you have that kind of energy again. Mm. You have that kind of you know the ideas with that kind of impact, but they find themselves blocked at the level of political mm. expression. Yeah, uh, and whether that f- the question for me is whether that feeds back into mm. democratic forms or whether it takes the form necessarily that I think is sometimes adumbrated in your book, mm. which is you know an anti-systemic. Mm. Um, politics that kind of can't find its expression I think I think I think the latter yeah you're right and that's that's a nice reading actually because I hadn't thought about it quite like that but I think that I suppose to go back to to Arendt's distinction between power and violence again which I think is so so rich and I think that you could argue if you're an optimist about crowds and and I I talk a little bit about Gustave Le Bon's very pessimistic view of crowds but if we can if we can try and flip that around into seeing the crowd as as, as potentially a marauding force but also as, as being able to do something different. Because a crowd brings something into existence that previously didn't exist, an anti-war march or uh, the March for Our Lives mm. or, um, uh, you know, there are all sorts of marches, civil rights movement. Um, there are various marches that have that have brought something into the world that previously didn't exist. That's what Arendt was very interested in, was that the way politics had this, what she called a, a natality about it, the capacity to give birth to, to new things. So that in that sense, a crowd has a, has a, has a positive political potential. Now, I, I mean, that clearly, we're, and I talk about crowds in the book, crowds have, have become part of our, our political landscape in a way that simply wasn't true in the 90s. And in that sense, I think that maybe we could see that as, as, as progress in its own rather kind of complicated way. Um, I think that the, the 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 difficulty is that um, for the for those movements that get kind of thwarted in some way that that you've been alluding to, one of the 
themes that runs through the book, I suppose, is is resentment. And resentment is a very interesting emotion because resentment, in a way, turns powerlessness into its own form of power. And in a way, if you can cultivate a, a mood of resentment amongst people, um, it has, which is what obviously what something like Trump can can do to a great extent. It's what aspects of Brexit, not all every aspect of Brexit, but it's it's a it's a powerful emotion um, in the sense that it it turns it it, it turns the, a feeling of weakness into a into a feeling of strength in some way, which is to say, uh, I'm going to take my uh, the fact that I've been ignored or victimized or marginalized in some way, and I'm going to I'm going to to to, to sort of flip that round in some way, and and and. Um, I talk about how Karl von Clausewitz was very interested in the uses of emotion to, to to build a German nationalism or Prussian nationalism in the in the in the mid nineteenth century. This is like you know maybe the fact that we've been stamped on by Napoleon repeatedly could become the basis of a new type of mobilization. Now the the, the thing about that is that the question is what what type of mobilization arises and to some extent is there a distinctive type of intervention that that stems from that which is a which is which is a which is a rather than one of one of power which is what a crowd potentially can do in its best form which is to build something to create something it does is there a risk with resentment when it's the trigger that it that it that it's that it leads to what Amrit would call violence, i.e., uh, because it stems from a feeling that one has been um, been mocked or, or or marginalized or ignored or something? Does it then simply t- turn into a politics of wanting to just ha- do harm to the person who who did that? Um, and there, in a way, you know, I, um, that, that 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 I mean, I use sort of example of sort of troll culture or something like that, where effectively you think, well, I've got no power anyway, so I'll use the one power I have, which is to go and and, uh, undermine uh, what other people are up to. Now, I don't know if that if, if that's true across the board, but I think that that's something we can see in potentially the way in which certain Brexit leaders are, are operating right now, which is that they don't have a positive vision for Brexit. What they have and what animates them is a sense that Britain has been, I mean, as absurd as it sounds, been sort of stamped on by Brussels for too long, or that in Bannon's terms, the Steve Bannon's terms, that the globalists have been kind of colonising us and these elites and so on, and, and it's time that the small people kind of fought back. Now, this is a very, very kind of mobilising, very mesmerising type of politics, um, and I think one of the, the, the dangers of it is that is that it, its effect is simply a desire to do harm back to the to the party that appears to have have have, have, have been doing the, the colonizing now obviously that you could argue that you know that 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 type of politics also operates on the left as well mm-hmm. but um i uh, would yeah <laughs> <laughs> on, on that i'm going to stop <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean I, but it's an interesting because you know i i i was thinking immediately of, of bannon as you were talking and that that desire to kind of you know, what was it? Destroy the administrative state. Mm. And that this is going to be his kind of great achievement, um, and that that you know, rather frustrated, I think, actually, in, in execution yeah, at the moment. Absolutely. Um, which is itself interesting, right? Is that is mm. the the way in which these administrations change as they that you know that these it, effectively these institutions have you know quite significant power in constraining the individuals who who you know who enter them. Yeah. Um, not absolute power, as we're finding out. No, sure. Um, but the, I mean, you know, the, the other thing that occurs to me, I guess, is that is that question about, or, or that when we're thinking about resentment, that I was thinking of the the work that Wendy Brown did, mm. you know, now some time ago, where she you know, writes about wounded attachments. So mm. that, and it, it, you know, you mentioned in the book the the, the quite quite significant uh, observation that Freud makes about. Uh, you know, an infant sort of throwing uh, mm. a toy away and then 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 taking it back as a kind mm. of repetition. Mm. And so for Brown, you know, she she doesn't draw on the Freudian example as far as I can remember, but she talks about um, you know the way in which actually kind of uh, wounded or or kind of traumatized subjectivities, mm. uh, you know, tend to form these kind of wounded attachments, right? Yeah. Either repeat or or kind of inscribe. Uh, you know that they're different, and so mm. you know I mean, she's arguing about you know the need to not merely uh, you know critique power, but also think about taking it, and mm. you know a project of universalism in that sense. It does strike me that it's a useful way of looking at yeah. the, the way in which that stuff is mobilised on the left, perhaps, mm. where there is a kind of resentment that yeah. that is often awkward and uncomfortable, uh, partly because it's grounded in in things we think are bad, right? Yeah, the, yeah sure. The, um, but nonetheless, has has these these potentially kind of uh, you know, dissolving or, or destructive effects. Well, that's. I mean, that's the, the. I mean, one of the 
uh, yeah, I mean, I talk about Freud's beyond the pleasure principle, um, which is such a sort of, in some ways, it's kind of, to go back to what I was saying earlier about the, the book beginning with the question of what happens to politics when self-interest is no longer the the, 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 the kind of governing sort of rationality. Um, something like beyond the pleasure principle is a, is a great place to, to turn to try and understand that. And I mean, Freud in that talks about the, the compulsion to repeat. Uh, and the his argument is that we repeat painful experiences and we return to painful situations um or painful relationships or whatever it might be um in in the hope that we might be able to take control of them in some way become the master of them in in some way so that so that although it doesn't give us pleasure or reduce our pain we become the agents in mm-hmm. some sense we achieve some kind of um agency in that situation now the the and that's something I think we need to understand and in some ways to respect, although it can be destructive and self-destructive in various ways. But I think that also the other, um, I mean, and this is the kind of key principle of psychoanalysis that may never work, but is that, is that you know, that you can get, you can kind of escape that mm-hmm. by, by through an act of mourning in some way. I mean, that's the sort of, now I, I don't really kind of, kind of develop that in the book, but that I think would be the, the, the way to sort of think about that question of wounded attachment mm-hmm. is to is to ask what the force forms of public mourning might be that um, that people do move beyond wounded attachments but I suppose I, I, and I'm conscious of my own privilege here so I don't really talk about that particularly in the book and I and nor do I particularly mm-hmm. want to I mean I, I, and I think that I hope the book is more punching up in yeah. that respect yeah, yeah, yeah. and and hopefully I can sort of contribute something useful in that respect because I think that what's interesting and kind of very frightening is that some of that logic is now at work amongst very powerful people mm. and that's really mm. I suppose more what the book is about yeah I mean for, for me that that question of wounded attachment is much more about the sort of stuff that goes on with you know uh, when you have kind of this kind of cabal of centrist journalists mm. or you know mm. uh, or, or, or kind of you know the Blairites mm. or, or whoever who are, you know, in one sense, you know, attempting to mm. to, to yeah. repeat this. You know, yes, kind of, right. This yeah, yeah. Say, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Impossible. But impossible equally, the thing. sense that which I talk a bit about in the book uh, that someone like Fintan O'Toole, I think, has been mm. writing a lot about recently, which is that Britain's only real understanding of itself is either as an imperial force or as an or as an, a colonized yeah. force, and it yeah, hasn't yeah, really yeah, got yeah, anything yeah. kind of in between. And therefore, really Brexit, and and of course, this is exactly the language that Steve Bannon uses. Um, and we shouldn't exaggerate Bannon's influence, I know, but he, nevertheless, he's a kind of interesting kind of uh, example. Uh, but which is that uh, that the, the nation has been colonized by the technocrats in some way. Now, it is the case, and this is the interesting issue, which I which I touch on a bit, is that of course these technocratic powers were designed partly to be colonizing imperial powers. This is kind of what this is central to their rationality, and in a way, the 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 the, the force of the of, of someone like Jacob Rees Mogg's thinking or, or Steve Banner's thinking is that um, the nation is now has now been kind of enslaved by some kind of um, foreign technocratic uh, global power that includes the European Commission. It includes Goldman Sachs, Wall Street, um, Hillary Clinton. You know that that there is a sort of this this this, this kind of network um, and. There's also, of course, the grain of truth, when, particularly in something like the European Commission, about about that 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 characterization. So um, th- th- I think that the, but I think that the the, the mobilization of a logic of, of 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 woundedness and resentment by, um, well, partly by um, the the sort of white male um, electorate that that. Um, was so important for the election of Donald Trump, but equally by people who are extremely rich, like mm-hmm. Jacob rees mogg yeah, and others, yeah, yeah, yeah. is is extremely worrying and needs to be kind of understood in 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 all those terms. There's a distinction that arises, I think, in the course of the book that's that's really interesting to me, and it's something that I I you know I think about all the time, which is the distinction between public and private. Mm. And in in one sense, one of the things that the whole book is about is the gradual disappearance of a public sphere, mm. Um, mm. and you know one of the things that I always think about that is that it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Mm. It's one of the things that Nancy Fraser points out is mm. that, like, the classic public sphere, for all its virtues, you know, was founded on a logic of exclusion, you know, for, you know, and she talks about kind of contestation here. She says, you know, look, it, it took, you know, a long period of contestation to to drag things out of, of, of the private into the public sphere. Mm. Um, and it involved a certain dissolution of the public sphere. And she, she uses the example of, 
um, domestic violence. She says it took a long concerted feminist campaign mm. to drag something like that out of the domain of the private into the public. Mm. You know, it's one of the things we can, you know, I tend to think of something like the, the recent Me Too mm. stuff in, in, in sure. that sense as well. Um, but I, I wonder also about you know, you know, and it's a story that's really terrifying in your book is, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's interest in Facebook telepathy. Yeah. So is there a concept of, of a distinction between private and public that's worth rescuing? Uh, well, I think that the there is a um, at least uh, a, a, a something that needs to be rescued, which is the idea of a of a shared world and and maybe this is something that can be found in in the work of someone like Arendt or something like that and no doubt in the work of Habermas as much of a of a sort of idealist he might as he might have been about the liberal bourgeois public sphere uh, who I assume is sort of the sort of figure that Nancy Fraser was probably kind of um, kind of uh, criticizing um, but I think that the alternative to having a shared world in that is constituted by a combination of facts produced by bureaucracies and experts, by reports made by journalists working for newspapers and boring old broadcasters and so on, and, um, you know, publishers that are seeking to produce things for a broad readership and uh, in, in, in a publish- public way. I think that the, the alternative to that, I think, is becoming clearer, which is, well, it's the, the, the more plausible alternative to that that is emerging at the moment, which is that there are sort of hidden depths of data um, that are held largely under private uh, and perhaps military control, um, which occasionally will kind of erupt like a sort of volcano through some kind of um, leak or whistleblowing or sort of WikiLeaks type thing or something like that. Um, but for the most part, uh, the rest that the, the we end up congregating around uh, shared commitments. Now, of course, that has all sorts of political energy uh, that it that it that it that it generates and so on. And you can, but it also, you know, Twitter at its worst is is a is a complete inability to even reach any kind of shared starting point mm-hmm. for a disagreement. And ultimately, what the the, the sort of ask, the bit of liberalism <laughs> that we I, I don't I don't want to get rid of is the bit that that goes the whole way back to the seventeenth century, which is to say, and I think what I think is interesting about Hobbes is that Hobbes was saying we need at the very minimum to guarantee life for people, um, and I think that that has some potential sort of radicalism that is not actually being kind of because if you think of Hobbes as a conservative and a liberal yeah. and a, sort of all this sort of and a realist and so, on, but there's a kind of radicalism about that. I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter is making a is 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 is, is attacking the US state for not valuing black lives as much as white lives and 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 in a way there's a kind of radicalism about this kind of you know getting liberalism right back to its its most its barest essentials which is how can modern society be possible in ways that people are able to live amongst strangers and people who they don't know and I think that's a good thing I enjoy traveling around London amongst strangers and people who might have all sorts of things going on in their heads that I have no idea about and I don't consider it any of my business that is an achievement of of, of, of modern politics and in some ways of liberalism I'm afraid um, and I think that there is there is some sort of bare essentials to that that I don't think that we can trust the likes of Mark Zuckerberg to actually preserve now you know Zuckerberg uh, has an interest in the body that you, that you mentioned, and I'm talking about, you know, in a sense, he's he's imagining a sort of a kind of brain to brain communication, a sort of cybernetic fantasy yeah. that, and this is the the second meaning of the word feeling in the books. Mm. It's not just emotions; it's also about sort of sensation in in a, in a in a in the way that is how you might feel your way through a dark room or something, which has always been a a kind of an obsession in warfare is how to kind of navigate situations where you don't have a, a map in a way, um, and in a way, what Zuckerberg. Uh, is seeking to do is to render the world controllable by Facebook, but not transparent to itself. He's not seeking a world that is transparent to that world in any way. And that's what we've discovered with the form of all of these adverts that were floating around during the 2016 elections that 99.999% of people had no idea they were going around. Now, that that looks like the alternative to some basic idea of, of a shared public sphere, right? Mm, I mean, I, what... W- what you're saying, I think it rings true to me and it's always struck me that 
you know, the promises of liberalism are, are often mm. very good. It's yeah. the fact that it hasn't been able to no, deliver. No, that's right. Them. Which is, I think, um, is also, I mean, it has to be seen as as, as the, the, the essence of the Marxist critique as well, which yeah, is that it, liberalism, you know, you don't reverse liberalism, you can, you finish it. Mm-hmm, you finish mm-hmm. it in the way that, that it, that it, um, that it was, that was too legalistic and, and, and delusional about the nature of human beings to have ever managed to do. So um, I think that that's, yes, I agree with that. I mean, so I, final question to you then, I think, um, is, and, and it sort of circles back to, to the discussion you have about war mm. um, th- throughout that second half of the book. And, and it sort of, it goes alongside that question or, or, or that matter in Hobbes that you just raised, which is, you know, so Hobbes is all about, you know, the basic guarantee is that we are able to prolong mm. life. Mm. Obviously, there's a species level problem with that yeah. at the moment. But it's also, it seems to me that, you know, there is something about, you know, war and the attraction of these kind of metaphors of war that are now everywhere, right? The rhetorical wars yeah. that proliferate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as you've kind of suggested about Brexit, these sort of war nostalgists. Mm. And, and the thing that's striking in them, in, you know, in other things like suicide bombing, mm. uh, is that there is a desire for meaning Mm. there as well Mm. so are there collective projects Mm. that can offer a sense of meaning uh Mm. that is as kind of fundamental uh as those things well this i think is a is a question that people have grappled with since probably since the french revolution or so and i mean william james actually wrote a Mm. uh, wrote a uh, an article about this in the in the late 19th century about exactly this and um I haven't read Francis Fukuyama's new book on identity politics, and I, I imagine can't. I won't. But I uh, but I, I, I've, I've read from one of the reviews that he recommends a, a, some sort of citizen service in there, which is one of these kind of recurring ideas, which is, oh, well, couldn't we have all of that sort of togetherness, uh, but but without the nastiness mm-hmm. in some way? And, um, and I mean, in some ways, bits of my book kind of... I mean, it's not that I'm, I'm sympathetic to that argument as such, but I can sort of see why liberalism ends in that sort of place in a way and uh you know it's it's um the idea that actually there is this sort of existential vacuum at the heart of liberalism which is that if all you know all you want is to be kind of left alone to in order to live long and prosper in some way uh of course looks extremely attractive if it's 1946 Mm -hmm. or uh 1849 or or, you know this is sorry i was actually meant 1649 (laughs) (laughs) um (laughs) the end of the 30 years war um um but um uh but you know that so um now i i i don't have the answer to that but i do i, I mean i i think it's interesting to consider something that i talk about at the end of the book which is the climate mobilization movement uh and of course people have said well surely nothing can mobilize people in that sort of um visceral existential political sense like the threat of um, of, of, of a sort of planetary level existential threat. Now, sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to make fascism more plausible in, in, in certain respects. But I am interested in what the climate mobilisation movement is is about. And and they, for those people who don't know it, I mean, it's well worth looking into. I mean, they it's partly a, a macroeconomic pro- pro- proposition, which is or fiscal proposition, which is to say, actually, the way to actually decarbonise the economy in the next, well, now we're told 12 years by the IPCC, is to do something roughly white, like what the US state did during World War II, where you requisition whole sections of the, of, of the private economy, you change everything that they're doing pretty much overnight, which is what the US state did with, with manufacturing when it entered World War Two, and um, but also it, it it sort of turns the entire venture into something more like war. Now the the question is, and this kind of, in some ways comes back to the the viability of a left populism and and the sort of arguments of Chantal Mouffe and so on is, can you do that without the enemy, can, with, without the other? Um, and I mean, can I mean th- th- this idea that that climate change is is like a world war? So there's something that doesn't quite it doesn't quite work in a way, and and in a way our vocabulary kind of seems to sort of let us down here, and maybe. You know, if I was maybe the one of the, the the flaws in my book, I suppose, is that it sort of is it remains trapped in this kind of Hobbesian vocabulary of of, of war and peace and violence and nonviolence and, and and so on. Um, but and maybe we need to kind of invent some some different sort of vocabulary for the for the for the Anthropocene or Capitalocene. Well, that's a challenge. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Cheers. That's it for this week. Thank you for joining me. I have been James Butler. This has been Navarra FM on Resonance one hundred four point four FM. We'll be back. 
at the same time, in the same place next week. Goodbye. This show is brought to you by Navarra Media. To find articles, videos and more audio content like this, head to navarramedia.com. If you've particularly enjoyed this podcast and encourage others to listen to it, why not head to iTunes and as well as subscribing, leave us a review. Navarra Media can exist only thanks to the generosity of our subscribers and supporters. If you have the means, please consider subscribing at support.navarramedia.com. As well as helping us continue to produce regular content, subscribers will also receive priority access to events, as well as promotions throughout the year. For regular updates, follow us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Navarra Media, media for a different politics. 